Welcome to Practice Update. I'm your host, Dr. Aman Shah, and I'm here with Dr. Alan Bryce. Welcome, Dr. Bryce. Thank you for having me. So you just told me something interesting that I hadn't thought of before, uh, that prostate cancer is the only major cancer which does not have a targetable uh, molecular marker. Yes. And we are here at ESMO, and it seems that that's about to change. Absolutely. Could you yes. tell us more about this? Yes. So traditionally, prostate cancer has been thought of as a androgen receptor dependent malignancy, which is certainly true, but compared to the other of these, say, big four tumors, so you think about lung cancer, breast cancer, colon cancer, where you all have established biomarkers for response, whether KRAS, ERPR, HER2, or EGFR, for example, prostate cancer to date has never had an established biomarker for treatment selection. And we're going to see that change uh, very quickly here. Uh, tomorrow at ESMO, uh, we'll get the results of the phase three profound study looking at the use of olaparib in prostate cancer with DNA damage response gene alterations, which would include uh, BRCA1 and 2 most significantly, but also ATM, uh, CHECK2, CDK12, uh, PALB2, FANK A, and a list of other genes. And although we haven't seen the data yet, we've seen the press release, and we certainly expect this is going to be a, a, a positive study when it gets reported tomorrow. So uh, could you uh, elucidate this relationship a little bit more? So uh, what is CDK12 and uh, yes. what is its role in uh, tumorigenesis? Yeah, so CDK12 has traditionally been thought of as being in the family of DNA damage response genes with BRCA and ATM and some of these other Fanconi pathway genes. That being the case, it is currently being included in the various PARP inhibitor studies that are going on in prostate cancer, of which there's four major drugs being tested uh, and a series of re results coming out from these studies. CDK12, though, is proving to be somewhat different from these other genes, and our understanding of the gene is certainly expanding. So more recently, uh, it appears to have a more prominent role in chromosomal stability. And so when you have CDK12 mutations on the somatic level, that is in the tumor and not in the germline, then we see the tumors will accumulate large tandem duplications as well as chromosomal rearrangements. And this is significant because these types of aberrations are really known to be more uh, powerfully neoantigenic than just point mutations. So the current state of affairs in tumor testing and oncology is to think of something called tumor mutational burden as being a predictor right. of response to immunotherapy. And TMB, for the most part, is based upon the frequency of point mutations. But the fact of the matter is that most point mutations are not antigenic. You know, this association between TMB and immunotherapy response is really just a probabilistic effect. Right. right? It's the idea that the more mutations you have, the more likely any one of, of them. Of 20 or so, I believe. But uh, yeah. Yeah. And, and that's, that's something of a arbitrary cutoff point. It's not a validated cutoff. Right. Keeping in mind that in prostate cancer, the the median TMB is two. So very few prostate cancers are high TMB. Right, right? okay. By any definition. Okay. Having said that, these large tandem duplications and chromosomal rearrangements are far more likely to produce a neoantigen than a point mutation are. And these type of aberrations are not typically included in this definition of TMB. So we are suggesting that these aberrations when they occur are more likely to predict the response to immunotherapy, but then how does one quantify that? Okay. In RCC, we see this, you know, renal cell cancer is traditionally a sure. immune responsive tumor, but it is a uh, TMB low tumor, but it has high internal tandem duplications. That's probably the predictor of response. And uh, just going back to the therapeutic yeah. implications, uh, from what you said, it seems like this is a completely different pathway and target yes. from the traditional androgen sensitive or you know, gastric resistant uh, settings. So would you see these uh, PARP inhibitors as being additive uh, to current therapy or uh, yes. yeah. how would these get integrated into uh, treatment? Yes. So so we have multiple studies coming to fruition. Uh, the first will certainly be, as we said, the profound study getting reported tomorrow. Uh, we'll, all, we'll also see the rucaparib data coming out of the Triton studies. Uh, we will see other olaparib data out of the Toparp study, and then the Galahad study with niraparib was also coming along. And in all of these studies, we're seeing very consistent results. So BRCA2 is the most common uh, 
most commonly mutated DDR gene in prostate cancer, both germline and somatic. BRCA1 is somewhat less common, you know, five to eight fold uh, in favor of BRCA2. And with either BRCA2 or 1, the response rate to PARP inhibitors with all of the PARP inhibitors is on an order of perhaps 50% both right. PSA response rates and resist response rates. Okay. And with give or take some variation in the various studies. With meaningful progression-free survival advantages, and one would anticipate overall survival advantage, although we haven't seen the data published yet. So this certainly looks like this will be the next therapeutic modality in prostate cancer, and the first one then that is connected to a definable biomarker, uh, and will provide an entirely different treatment modality uh, in the armamentarium against advanced prostate cancer. That sounds very, very promising. Thank you so much. Yeah, my pleasure.